And we're going to start with James, the fifth chapter, and we use this as our theme. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Interesting, and again, there's so much that we could go into. Interesting that there's a connection with sin and sickness. That is not to say that if you are sick, that you have some hidden sin. That is not to say that. We can't jump to those conclusions. But there is the combination of forgiveness of sin and sickness. Do you remember that we talked to you about the meaning of the term sosa and, and that it encompasses the term for salvation, which means wholeness. It means wholeness, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual wholeness. And so therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we're going to deal today, as I said, with misunderstandings and questions. And I really didn't have any particular direction other than I just dove right in. And so I have misunderstanding number one that I find in regards to divine healing as I speak to many individuals and even myself is the misunderstanding that healing in the Bible with Jesus and with the apostles was automatic. <clears throat> Meaning they could heal at any time, at any place, anyone, at will. That wherever Jesus went, he could heal anyone he wanted to. Because after all, he was the Son of God, was and is the Son of God. And so uh, one of the misunderstandings we have in considering whether healing is still active, God heals in the same way as he did in the Bible, is the misunderstanding of this issue of automatic. And so we see scriptures that indicate certainly Jesus operated at a level of healing that was incredible. He's the Son of God. He walked in full obedience, total obedience. He had unrestricted access to the Holy Spirit. And it says in many places, such as Matthew 9.35, it says that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Healing every disease and sickness. In other places, it's, it says, you will be able to find them if you do a search in the New Testament, he healed everyone who was sick. In another place, it says he was in a setting and he healed all who were ill. And so that, those verses give an indication, if you're making a surface study of the healing ministry of Jesus, which was also connected, as we said last week, with signs and wonders. If you're doing a surface study, you can jump to the conclusion that, healing, that Jesus healed anybody he wanted, anywhere he wanted, anytime he wanted, because he had un, unlimited power of healing. So we're not eliminating the tremendous, <laughs> miraculous power of Jesus. I mean, Jesus had jaw-dropping examples of healing, raising people from the dead, going into funerals, raising them from the dead. I mean, I would love to see that just once. I would love to go into a funeral home and see Jesus walk up to the casket and say, hey, quit crying and just get up, and that person, hey, help him get out of that casket. You talk about news, that would be some news right there. People would be just blown away. So Jesus was at a level that was incredible. However, we must recognize that he operated by, the Bible teaches, and through the Holy Spirit. Everything Jesus did, he did not do because he was the Son of God. He came and operated and set the pattern and led the way for those who would follow him. He operated, it would be unfair for him to ask us to operate in obedience and, and listening to the Holy Spirit and through the power of the Holy Spirit and him to operate in a different way. Him to say, go do, and by the way, I did it in a different way than you. 
that would be unfair. So he came as the second Adam and he demonstrated what it is like to operate in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have many examples of this, uh, some that I don't have on the board, but for one example that comes to my mind very quickly is when he was tempted, uh, he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a message and a teaching in that in itself. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for what purpose? To be tempted. Interesting. And he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. And it was a tremendous temptation. It was incredible. He faced every category of temptation that you and I face to a level that you and I cannot comprehend. And he came out of it, unlike us, he came out of it victorious and perfect and sinless. And it says that when he came out of the wilderness, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 18, when he stood before his own hometown and he made the declaration as to who he was and he opened up the scroll at that day and he read Luke, what we have as Luke 4, 18, he let, read out of Isaiah, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to do this, 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 and this. So we need to recognize that everything Jesus did he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 5.8, you can look that up later. It says that son, though he was, son, capital S-O-N, son of God, though he was, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience. It's incredible for us to imagine that Jesus had to learn to obey. He learned obedience. He was the son of God. He was perfect, but he was man. He was very God and he was very man, the, Bible, the, the, the doctrine tells us. Luke eleven twenty, 20, Jesus himself said after he had cast out or driven out some demons out of individuals, he said, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, the finger of God is always a reference to the Holy Spirit. If I drive out demons by, how do I drive them out? Because I'm the son of God? No. And, and demons would cry out and say, we know who you are. And Jesus would tell them, to tell them to be quiet. How did he drive out demons? By the spirit of God. So everything Jesus did, he did by the same Holy Spirit who lives in you and I. By the same Holy Spirit that he has given to us. That's how this operated. Luke 4, 14, as I read to you before or quoted to you, he came out by the power of the Spirit and news about him spread throughout the countryside. Now, there were many times and occasions where the Bible tells us Jesus healed all, as I just said, who were sick. But for us to jump to the conclusion that Jesus and the apostles to whom he transferred this power and they received the power of the Holy Spirit in the second book of Acts, second chapter of Acts, if we think that they healed anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances, we are mistaken. I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some examples. In Luke 5, 17, one day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Now, why were they sitting there? They were sitting there to trick him. They were sitting there just to pick at him, to find something. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And then listen to the wording of the Bible. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Another, uh, another translation more accurately says, the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Now, this is clearly a statement that there were other times when the power of the Lord to heal was not present. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But this makes a clear indication the power of the Lord was present. If you say that something was present, there's an indication that at times, other times, it was not present. The power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. Notice with me, we'll get deeper into this and it will be self-explanatory. Remember in our first lesson, we said that the Bible interprets the Bible. In John 3, verse 3 through 6, here, it talks about Jesus going into the area, the pool of Bethesda. My wife and I have been there. We were there in the city of David, which they're, they're still excavating. It's incredible. It's outside of the old wall, what they call the old wall, which was not 
The old wall is not as old as Jerusalem by any means. It was erected actually by Muslims after they conquered Jerusalem, but it's really old compared to anything in the United States. But outside the old wall, there's, there's, there's four lane highways, there's busy traffic going all over. On the other side of that, they're excavating the city of David. And I, I would spend time talking to you about it, but we don't have time. It's tremendously interesting. The palace of David is there. And um, in their excavation, they discovered the steps and we walked on them, they were still unearthing them, to the pool of Bethesda. There's a flat area and then there are several steps, huge, huge area, larger than this sanctuary, much longer than this. And they've totally uncovered it now. And it was a pool that had steps going down on all sides and a huge patio area. Well, John tells us in John 3, 3 through 6, and a great number, great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, by this pool. It was like an outdoor hospital. One who had been there, an invalid for 38 years, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him and him alone, do you want to get well? Now let's think about this. There is this common thought that if Jesus was here, he would walk into all of our hospitals, he'd go into Salem Hospital and just clear the rooms. Here we have an example of many more people than are in the Salem Hospital. Sick, infirmed, people who are blind, lame, paralyzed, lying all around. And the Bible is very clear that Jesus walked up to only one man who would have been crowded around by other sick people. And he said to him, do you want to get well? So it is a, it is a living illustration for us that perhaps our misunderstanding of what Jesus would do is, is exemplified in the Bible. Jesus did not heal everyone everywhere. I could give you one more quick example that leaps into my mind. In the book of Acts, Peter and John are on their way to the temple and they walk by the gate called Beautiful and there is a lame man laying there. I, the gate, if they're walking past the gate Beautiful to go to the temple and the man had been there a long time, the Bible says, then Jesus had walked by the gate to go to the temple with his disciples many, many times because that was that man. When we lived in Florida, there were certain exits that when we got off of that exit, when we lived there for a short time, there were people that begged at the end of that exit. I see Larry nodding his head. And that was their spot. Do not take their spot. In fact, there would be fights that would break out if somebody else tried to take their spot. Because off that exit, that's, where, that's their spot. This was this man's spot. He'd been there many, many, many years. Jesus had walked by that man, but had not healed him. It wasn't until Peter and John one day walked by him. And the power of God for some reason and the instruction of God came upon Peter. And Peter asked him to look at him. And then in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man was healed. So why would this be? Why would this be? Jesus clarified the reason for this in John 5, 19. I don't have that one up here. John 5, 19. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So Jesus worked through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not eliminating nor, nor detracting from his divinity. He was and is God. He's the Son of God. But the way that he operated in healing was through the Holy Spirit. The Bible is very clear. And he also only healed in those times and circumstances that he, because of his undiluted communication with the Father, knew this is what God wants me to do. 
Another example of that in the King James Version, the disciples are going somewhere and Jesus said to them, in the King James Version, it's very awkward in our, in our English today, but I, I still like the way it's translated. Jesus said to his disciples, I must needs, I must needs go through Samaria. Study that sometime. I must need go through Samaria. What was he saying? He said, I have to go through. You and I often wake up thinking, I sure hope I do today what God wants me to do, all right? I want to obey the Lord. I want to hear him. I want him to order my steps. But many times we make a shotgun. I'll just speak for myself, a shotgun approach. I'm going to do as much good as I can today in as many areas as I'm afforded as I can, because hopefully I will hit what God wanted me to do today, right? Because I want his will in my life. Jesus knew that there was a woman in Samaria waiting for him by the well. He said, I have to go through Samaria. You and I, we need more communication from the Holy Spirit so that we know what must needs we do. The disciples weren't there. They said, okay, we'll go get some food. And so they went to get food and Jesus was on that very specific assignment. So Jesus only did what the Holy Spirit showed him the Father wanted him to do. Very clear. He said, I can only do what the Father shows me to do. All right. I love the looks I'm getting from you. I see behind your eyes. You know, there's vacant stairs, and then there's stairs where, like, I can almost see smoke coming out of some of your ears. It's like, okay, I don't know. Well, let me give you one more that really God showed me, and it really shook me. Mark the sixth chapter, verse five. How are we doing on time? Oh, fine. Mark 6, verse 5. Is this okay that we go like this? We may not get through today, but we're going to make sure we explain it well. Mark 6, 5. Jesus has gone back to his hometown. Fame has spread everywhere. People are following him. You remember there were times he said, let's get in the boat. By the way, if you think Jesus was superhuman and at times did not get exhausted, you're wrong. Because there were times he ran from the crowds. He ran from them. He said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side. Why did he do that? He was human. The demand was incessant. It just, he was, he was very God, but he was very man. He said, I've got to get a break. Well, he went over to the other side. Guess what? They found out he was going over there. Da, 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 da. They, they went over there. And it says he got out of the boat. When he got out, he looked at them and he had compassion. So the human side, can't you see the human side of Jesus saying, I've got to get some rest. But then he looks and he says, okay. And he began, he, he began to do what the father told him to do. But he goes back to his hometown. He began to teach in her synagogue. And his hometown people that he was raised in front of, they saw him walk around with a diaper on. They knew Mary. They knew his family. They saw him grow up as a little boy. They watched him work and learn how to do things. And all of a sudden, here he comes back as an adult man. And he begins to declare things to them. And it says they were offended at him. And the more or less they said, and Jesus said, a prophet is not accepted in his own country. And more or less they said, don't, don't say that to me. Don't, don't, don't you come in here. We've heard you're big and famous all out here. But don't be coming in here telling us. We know you. That's exactly what they said. We know you. We know your brothers. That's exactly what they said. We know your family. Don't be coming in here all highfalutin. And the Bible says he could not, Mark 6, 5, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Why? It goes on in another place in the scripture to say he marveled, he was amazed at their unbelief. Time? All right. I'm going to finish this point so fast. The Bible mentions, th I can see this as precipitating questions. The Bible mentions three occasions when Paul was not able to see his friends healed. Epaphroditus in Philippians 2, 25 through 27. Trophimus, T-R-O-P-H-I-M-U-S. You know, there's some, there's some 
names in the Bible that I'm glad got, that my parents didn't name me. <laughs> right? Nebuchadnezzar would be one. <laughs> hey, Nebi. 2 Timothy 4.20 And Timothy, his son in the Lord. 1 Timothy 5.23 Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Why didn't you just heal him? Oh, we're going to get into it, okay? I'm at point two, and we're going to talk about the way, the style in which Jesus healed and the apostles, the methods that they used, some of the things that may shock you, but we've got to turn this on. For example, I'll just give you a little teaser. In one occasion, Jesus spoke to the blind man, and he was healed. On another occasion, he didn't speak to the blind man. He knelt down, he took dirt off the ground, he mixed it with spit and put it on his eyes. Don't box God. God will not be boxed up. In fact, he'll do things different, I think, sometimes just to mess with us. Because he wants us to follow him. He wants us to hear him. He wants us to walk with him. All right, we're going to give you an opportunity. I felt important that you have the opportunity to hear with your own ears. Jack, you can get that all teed up and ready to go. It's five minutes and some seconds long. An actual healing. This is a recording of a Sunday school lesson that's being taped in Texas in the First Baptist Church by a pastor who had contracted an infection in his vocal cords. It had destroyed the my my myelin sheath over his cords after the infection had gone it left him without a voice, and they told him, the doctor said he would never have his voice for the rest of his life. He had to resign his pastorate, but his adult Sunday school class in another church, the adult Sunday school class, wanted him to teach. He would teach painfully uh, with a special microphone, Sunday school, and then after, he would have a sore throat for two days, an extremely sore throat. So you're going to hear this pastor. By the way, I just saw him on YouTube, lest any of you ask if this lasted, I just saw him talking about this video, but we don't have time to play the whole video. But you can look him up, and he tells this story. But you're going to hear him talking about healing, and you're going to hear God do something fantastic, and you'll even hear the Sunday school class respond in the background. And then we will, does God do miracles today? This was 1993, and then we'll close in prayer. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals, all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. Now you have to be careful on how you do this. Because there are folks who carry things to an excess and it becomes a show. And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in his sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that he does. But I know that he does. And the only thing he requires of me is to allow him to be God and me to be me and let it be. To say that every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of Scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again, is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then in verse 4 he says, And he redeems my life from the pit. Now I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for 
the pit we find ourselves in. <sighs> and I don't understand this right now. <laughs> I'm but overwhelmed at the moment. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm uh, Sounds funny to say a loss for words. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I <sighs> He redeems my life from the pit. <laughs> And crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in love. The Lord will not accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's mercy. Or repay us according to our iniquities. That's mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. Well, that has been checked and rechecked and rechecked and rechecked by those who do not believe that God heals today. And they cannot, they have no explanation for this. It is an incredible real time recording of God healing, a divine healing. And God used this powerfully in my life, like I said, in the 90s. This came out around the time I was walking this journey in regards to the power of God that is available, the level of the power available for today. And so that God used this. I listened to this over and over again. No one was more skeptical than Tim Ginner. And I would actually debate individuals on the gifts of the Spirit. I actually debated individuals. And I had my facts down pat, I thought, until God in the summer of 93 destroyed every argument. I would go over and scrape that house and had a headset on and I'd be arguing with God. What about this? It was a time of incredible clarity with the Holy Spirit because almost instantly verses would pop into my head. Well, God knows the Bible. He wrote it. And verses would pop into my head and it would totally disassemble every argument that had been given to me. God was tearing down those things that were actually eliminating the level at which he wanted to operate in my life and through my life. He was very gracious to me. I was a very, very stubborn, dogmatic individual. I know that's difficult for you to believe, but, but I was. <laughs> And I'm so thankful that I'm not that way anymore. <laughs> well, let's close in prayer. And uh, is, this, is this being helpful? Is it giving you insight into healing? Um, his name is Pastor Dwayne. Is there a title on that? Dwayne Miller? Dwayne Miller. Pastor Dwayne Miller. Just the way it sounds. D U A N E. M-I-L-L-E-R. Well, let's pray. And let's pray to the God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above anything we're able to ask or think, right? According to the power that works in us. 
Okay, what power is working in you? The power of the Holy Spirit. To what level is that power working in you? According to the power that works in us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity again to study your word. We thank you, Jesus, that despite our shortcomings, despite our um, inability to totally understand and the questions we have and even the doubts that we have, we're so thankful that your word, again, stands strong and true and tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for that. We pray that you will continue to work in our minds, in our hearts. Holy Spirit of truth, continue to work in us. May none of us think that we're at the end of our road of learning in regards to this life as a believer, this journey. But may we all, oh God, diligently seek you as the Bereans did in the book of Acts. And they would go home and diligently search the scriptures to make sure that Paul was teaching them what was accurate. We thank you, Lord, that you're still alive and at work today. And we pray that your spirit will be continue to guide and direct us, permeate, saturate our lives and the worship service as we gather together to worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful day. Questions, remember to submit those to me and get those to me. We'll try to answer as many as we can.